Hello everybody and welcome to part three of our bronze casting video. In this section of the video we are going to be getting our flask ready uh, for pouring and then we're also going to get our plaster mixed up and poured. Uh, this is going to be a, probably one of the longer segments simply because there's a lot going on. We're going to have to have a couple pieces of new equipment that I want to show you guys and uh, so sit back and relax and enjoy. So, starting off, of course, we have our flask, and the first thing that we're going to have to do with our flask is we're going to have to tape the flask up uh, because we are going to have to pour a liquid plaster into here, and as you can see, this is not exactly what you would think of as a cup. So, we're going to start off with some construction paper, or craft paper, rather. And the first thing we've got to do is actually enclose the sides of our flask. And I got a little bit of a neat trick here. I just kind of measure off there. So I have a curly piece. And we wrap this guy. Now you want this to be kind of snug, so what I do is I raise it up just a little bit and I kind of pull it taut and I'll tape it. But one thing I am going to do is I'm going to leave a little bit of a gap here on the bottom because we're going to wrap this whole thing with tape, but that seal on the bottom is where all the pressure is going to be. So if you do not tape this up correctly, uh, what's going to end up happening is you're going to have plaster that runs out and then there's a real problem. This is just some regular uh, masking tape and we are going to go all the way. Now the reason that I use the paper is because when you have to get this off, if you just use the tape itself, it's a pain to get off, and plus the paper gives you a bit, basically an extra barrier uh, to, from having to go. Okay. I come back in and I really want to work this down because you don't want any of this coming loose when you pour, and we're going to top it off to the right level. Just like that. You guys can see we now have our flask. So now we're going to flip it upside down. We'll make sure I want that edge right there is clean. Yep. And now we take our piece, and this rubber cap is designed to fit very, very snugly onto here. You kind of have to lift it out just a little bit to get it to fit. There we go. There we go. There's our cap, and you can see our piece down in here. And it will now sit just like this. And now this is where we've got to mix our plaster, pour this in here, and let it set up. What was that? Did you say meow? Come on. Come on, say hey to everybody. Come on. There you go. All right. Um, so we're good to go on that end of things. Uh, like I said, but there are going to be a couple pieces of equipment that I have to introduce you to. Now, I've been running my mouth about the proper equipment all the way up until this point. So the press, the wax injector pot, these are all things that are usually better to buy off the shelf. But for the size of the flask that we were using, there's really not a good off the shelf version. Basically, if you go to this industrial level and we're actually we're throwing or, or, or pouring six of these at a time, uh, you do not have equipment that can properly vacuum um, or, or pull a vacuum on these. So we had to engineer some. So let's uh, go look at our homemade vacuum tank and let me explain to you why this process is important. So there really is a whole lot to cover here. So let's start by why you need a vacuum tank. Okay, so if you're doing sand casting, we talked about earlier that what you end up doing is you actually have vents that allow air to escape, um, which is good. But when you're doing plaster, plaster by its nature, there's really no way for an air bubble to escape when you're pouring the plaster before it's set up. So basically if you have this thick plaster and you stir it up really aggressively, it's got air bubbles that are trapped inside there. Now, traditionally you could have used almost like a concrete vibrator to actually try to get some of those bubbles out. But the problem is, is when you're doing 
really fine jewelry work, the really small bubbles can be a real big problem because those bubbles have a tendency to stick to your wax. And even if you have a bubble that's an eighth of an inch and it's stuck to a ring that's the size of a ring, that's a real problem. So when you do investment casting, having a way to extract all the air, even from the liquid plaster, is terribly important. And that's why you have to have a vacuum tank. Now, if you guys have followed the work a lot, you guys know that we use a vacuum tank to actually bring linseed or to pull linseed oil into our handles. We actually, you know, really soak them all the way through by using that particular technique. And so what we've had to do is make something that's a little bit larger. Now, when we mix up that flask, I know it doesn't look like it, but that flask, in addition to using about three quarters of a gallon of water, it also uses 15 and a half pounds of powdered plaster. So when you mix this stuff up, it's in a really good size bucket. And you have to have something big enough to hold that. And that's where this guy came in. So you have to pull the vacuum on the plaster once you mix it to pull the majority of the bubbles out of it. And that's why we built our own custom vacuum tank. That's why we've got to have it. And now let's take a quick look on exactly how we put it together. So if you guys have seen a lot of the vacuum casting, or especially if you're like stabilizing woods, if you're a knife maker, you may have seen this before. You have a vacuum tank, you have some vacuum pumps, and basically that you put your item in the tank with your resin or whatnot, pull the vacuum and it sucks it into the wood. So what we're doing here is almost the same idea, except we're just pulling the air out, but we're just not putting anything back in our liquid plaster. So the first challenge, especially with the virus being here, uh, I really couldn't go to the scrap yard, so I had to use what was on hand, and even then I couldn't really find what I needed. However, a good friend of mine, Mr. Mike Moulton, you guys have may have seen him on the videos before, he is the armorer from down in Bainbridge, Georgia. Uh, he had a propane tank. Now, not like, a, not like a, a barbecue grill propane tank, but an actual fuel gas tank like you would use in oxygen acetylene. Uh, it had a much larger diameter than the stuff that I have, and that's really what I needed. So it's a sealed tank, pretty, pretty simple there. Uh, it has this top. Uh, that is a piece of aluminum, and you can see that I've got my dial and, and uh, pressure relief valves on here. And more importantly, you can see that I've got a sight glass so I can actually watch the plaster as it's being pulled. And it seats right here and pulls down pretty quickly. Now, uh, issue number one, and this has been an issue with us for a very long time, is that you have to have a perfect seal right here. And for ever since we started trying to do these tanks, that was an issue because even if you were to cut pieces out of flat steel trying to get a gasket that was of the right size that was of the right durometer which is the softness of it it was damn near impossible uh, i mean i probably spent 150 bucks trying to find different pieces of rubber that was squishy enough that it would actually make a seal um, if there was any imperfection in the lips that you were putting it on it caused a problem i mean it was it's been a damn nightmare and even when I built this tank, I was still having an issue getting a seal. I tried rubber gaskets. I tried to order, tried to find silicon gaskets. None of it worked. Tried to use a piece of rubber tire from an inner tube. I will tell you guys, it was one of the most frustrating things I've run across. But then, but then, um, I went to YouTube University and I saw a gentleman that had made a silicon gasket. He actually took a piece of ply board, cut a groove, and then just put silicone in there to make a gasket. Tried that, still really didn't do the job. But I was doing some research uh, for a different type of casting, which we'll be doing on the videos in a couple of weeks, um, in making silicon molds. And there was a particular technique for doing a one-sided mold where you actually mix silicone just right out of the tube with cornstarch, and it makes a putty that can then cure it a few hours. And I'll tell you guys, uh, that little bit of information allowed me to make this gasket right here, which having this has just been amazing. It's got enough give to it that it bites down. When I built this particular ring, I was able to set my top on there. And so the surface is perfectly mated. Just absolutely phenomenal. Cannot tell you how happy I have been 
uh, with this end of things. So I'm just stoked. So this is a cornstarch and silicon gasket and probably the most important uh, feature of this construction. Okay, so there's our tank. The next problem was actually getting a vacuum. And the first vacuum pump I bought was this guy right here. Uh, this is a 6 CFM single stage pump. This is about 150 bucks. It wasn't cheap. Um, and this worked very well for our small tank that we were actually doing our hammer handles in. Uh, the issue comes in is that when you've got such a large volume to pump air, of, air out of, you've really got to have speed on that end of it. And that's where we had to bite the bullet and now we actually bought a bigger one, uh, which this is a two-stage pump and it's eight CFM. Still wasn't enough. So now, especially on this large tank, we actually have them hooked in tandem. Now, just to give you an idea, and this is where we're really kind of jury rigging uh, this end of it. To buy a single, let's say a 15 CFM vacuum pump is two or three grand. So even though we had to pay about 150 for this one and 250 for this, and we are still at 10% of what the real equipment uh, does, and it does the same job. Very happy with this setup. I, I even with and there's a couple of issues here that we're going to correct a little bit later. One, we can actually narrow down this tank size a little bit. You know, you want the smallest volume of air that you have to pump out. So, but between the two tandem run vacuum pumps and the silicon gasket, this is what we're going to use to actually vacuum out our plaster. So just give me, tell you to give you an idea, what's going to happen is we're going to mix up our plaster. Uh, we will put the plaster in the tank. We will pull the vacuum on it. We'll pull that vacuum for, once we get to uh, uh, about 20 or, or 30 on a, a completely no atmosphere, you'll actually see the plaster roll over. We'll hold it there for about 90 seconds. We'll pull it out, we'll pour it into our flask, and then, very importantly, because when you pour this into the flask, you're creating more air bubbles. So then you immediately take the flask, put it back into the tank, and you vacuum the flask for just a little bit, and then you let it sit. Um, there's a time frame on this, because once you mix, mix the plaster up, it's gonna start setting in about five or six minutes, so you've gotta be quick on this, but that's what's gonna happen. And hopefully, by the time all this is done, uh, we're going to end up with one flask with invested in plaster and then we give it a couple of hours to set up and then we're ready to put it into the burnout oven, which I got to show you the burnout oven. All right, let's mix up some plaster. All right, now there's going to be a couple of issues that I'm going to run into and I know this right off the bat because this particular equipment technique was all prototype stuff. We really haven't had time to take this stuff apart and make it better. So a couple things. One, I mentioned before uh, that it's gonna take a little bit too much time to actually pull that vacuum because the tank size is too big. It really needs to be cut down. Uh, the second thing is, is that normally what happens is when you have filled your flask with plaster, it's a very easy situation of actually sitting this thing on top of a table and you usually have a big dome that goes over it and it vacuums. We don't have that. So what I'm gonna to have to do is actually use a pair of crucible tongs to pick this flask up very carefully because I don't wanna tear the tape and I also certainly uh, don't want to spill it and I'm gonna to have to actually set it down in the big tank to vacuum it. Once again, we're at the same situation where it's gonna take some time to vacuum all that air out and it's just a pain in the butt. So what you're gonna see is a make-do situation. It's not ideal, so just bear that in mind. Uh, this is really, with this setup, because we were under such a deadline, when I ran into the problem, normally we stop and fix the equipment or redo it. We didn't have time, so we're simply still doing what we're doing to get by with this. So if it looks weird, it's because it is. Well guys, there's our flask. It has now been poured up and uh, you may not have seen it, but we came real close to screwing up right there simply because it took me so long to vacuum 
this stuff. Now normally, uh, when I pour these up, I'm actually pouring a double stack, so there's a lot less volume in there. But the point is, is it took so long to get it to vacuum and actually roll over, that by the time I came out to add the last little bit to the top of it, it was already starting to thicken up, and I actually had to apply it with my hand. So hopefully, hopefully, uh, it's not going to blow out the bottom. So again, this is one of the aggravations when you're dealing with equipment that is not set exactly to what you need. However, uh, it looks pretty good for the situation right now. Uh, now we will leave it for two hours and then it will need to go into the burnout oven to complete the cycle. Uh, for a flask of this size, the burnout cycle is 12 hours. So this will be something that we put in tonight and then be ready to pour in the morning. But I've still got to walk you through exactly what our oven's going to do, how it's set up, and uh, but hey, one step closer. So hang tight, I need some tea. So what I have here is my super cool oven. Now, if you will notice this little pattern that's on here, you may have seen this before. This looks kind of like one of the nice forges that we build. Well, that's because this piece actually came from some of the guys that helped me uh, build my forges, which is Mr. Phil Vinson uh, with the Mobile Glass Studios up in Americas, Georgia. And we needed an oven that was big enough to hold six of our flasks. And so basically I went up there and looked around and uh, basically pirated this guy. This is one they had built that they used in the shop. And, uh, but it was big enough to actually hold six flasks. So this thing is actually about two and a half feet deep. I mean, it's a, it's a really, really big oven. And I had to make a couple of modifications, of course. Uh, one, the original element that was in here really wasn't going to do the job because this is normally used for annealing glass. So it had a 120 volt element, didn't have a lot of power. With these flasks, the flask actually has to come up to 1300 degrees Fahrenheit for about four hours. So you really need a, a better element in here. So I had to rip out the old element, put in a bigger one and then I had to actually adjust the control system that's on here. Now what I'm using here is that you can buy these on Amazon. This is actually comes from a company called Albert. This is a, a PID controller. Um, man, I'm gonna tell you, these things kind of changed my world. Uh, I have this type of controller on just about every oven I have out there. In fact, uh, when my Paragon temperature controller went out, I replaced it with one of these. So Paragon makes a very fine product and they've got a heck of a controller, but they want several hundred dollars for it. And when mine died, I was able to replace it with a controller for only about 40 bucks. Now this is an upgraded version. This is actually about 80 or 90 bucks, but this is programmable because the burnout cycle that I have to have for this guy is way different than a tempering cycle I would have on a knife. For example, if I'm going to work on a knife, basically I need to bring it up to temperature and it may need to hold for a certain amount of time. That's relatively simple. It can be done manually. It may take an hour or two. The burnout cycle for this flask is actually 12 hours long. It goes up to 300 degrees, is held for two hours, 700 degrees for two hours, 900 degrees for two hours, and then 1350 for four hours, and then back down to 1000 where we actually pour. So. Unless you want to be awake all night trying to tinker with this thing, you need to have a programmable version. That's what we have here. So uh, what, we, what will happen now is that our flask is now fully cured. It's been out of here for about two hours. It's achieved what we call full grain strength. Uh, we're going to cut our paper away, pull the plastic or the rubber cap off of it, drop it in here, and we'll start the program. Now, uh, hopefully, let's see, it's about 7 o'clock now, so that means that if everything goes ideally, uh, tomorrow morning about 8 o'clock will be when it will be ready to pour, and that won't be a problem at all. So what we'll do is we'll get the flask, we'll get it loose, we'll take a look at it, pop it in and fire this bad boy up, and tomorrow we pour. So now you can see that our plaster is nice and stiff, it's hardened up. We are at full green strength and what I'll do now is I'll just take this paint knife, break down the side, and then we need to remove both the tape and the paper. Now what's wild is the chemical reaction that causes this plaster to harden also generates heat. So this thing's actually warm to the touch. There's a couple things we've got to make sure of here. 
Uh, if the paper was not completely tight, there may be some plaster on the edge, and that's going to cause a problem when we actually get ready to put this down into the vacuum caster. So I come around, certainly making positive that this bottom ring right here is absolutely free of any debris or extra plaster because that's where it has to seal and if you have anything on there uh, you're not going to get a seal and therefore you're not going to get a good cast. So we'll make certain here. Usually I'll take a wire brush uh, before we uh, put this back in the oven. Okay. See that right here? That's got to come off. Uh, the fit, these damn mosquitoes are out here, it's crazy. Uh, the fit is really tight on the vacuum caster. So what happens if you drop this down in there and you've got stuff on the edge, it'll actually fall off and get in the, around the seal and it will cause a problem. So there we go. Now what we're gonna do, we're gonna roll this guy over very gently put it right here. Uh, again, we'll take our paint knife and now, now if you're paying attention, I pointed out that on this rubber cap there was a little cone and that cone's very important when it comes off. So let's pull this up. See our cone right here? And if you'll notice now, what we have is we have that same indentation. There's our wax sprue. But what that cone does is that now gives us a nice little place to pour our metal. So we're good to go right there. So I'll brush off this excess. Make certain we don't have anything on the sides. And it looks like we are ready to go into our oven. Oh, this joke is heavy. So what I'm going to do is when I pop this in here, uh, I'm actually going to make sure that this is sitting uh, in between one of these blocks. You see we've got some bricks in here. That is so the wax can easily drip out. She's in place. We'll close her up. And I actually have a uh, disconnect switch uh, right over here. So all I have to do is, and she's starting to cook. So, over the next 12 hours, this temperature will slowly ramp up. The first bit starts to melt the wax out. Uh, as it continues to ramp, it completely dries the plaster. And also what it does is when you get to the really high temperatures around 1350, what it does, any carbon that was left or fires or, or any residue that may be in there, it completely burns out. Uh, once it's gone through that for about four hours, it then cools down to about a thousand degrees, which is where we're actually going to pour our bronze. Now, the way I programmed this guy is that just in case I oversleep or something happens, it can hold that thousand degree temperature for quite some time without a really bad problem. So in the morning when we get up, again, it, it won't be exactly 12 hours because the program doesn't start the timer until the oven catches the right temperature. So it takes a long time for it to go from 900 to 1350, probably an hour or better. So it's usually a little bit longer. So I wake up in the morning, see what stage of the program that we're at, and then go ahead and get my foundry ready. So guys, there is part three. In part four, you're gonna see us actually casting the bronze and seeing what comes out of the plaster. It's super cool. And then the last part of our video is going to be about putting a little bit of a patina uh, on these pieces. So real excited. Well guys, again, hope you enjoyed it. If you liked the video, hit like, hit subscribe, check out our Patreon page. Outside of that, guys, thank you so very much for watching and I'll see you next time.